And joining us now here in studio, Craig Oliver, the veteran journalist and author of Oliver's Twist, The Life and Times of an Unapologetic News Hound. It's great to have you here in the studio. Thank you. Thank you for doing this. In, in reading the book, I got to say, I'm, I'm sure very few of us think about the childhood that the people who are on our screens every night doing the news uh, went through. But yours sounded truly harrowing. So take us back to the days in Prince Rupert, British Columbia, and start with, of all things, your mother who abandoned you. What was that about? Well, uh, this was wartime in Prince Rupert. Uh, life was fast and easy and uh, quick. And uh, my earliest memories are of uh, loud, drunken bouts between my mother and father, glasses breaking, terrible obscenities. I would start crying and say, please stop, and then they would stop for three or four minutes and then start again. Uh, and then one day my mother just kind of disappeared. They were never married, my parents. They were both alcoholics. And my father was in no position. He was a bootlegger uh, who had been uh, charged and convicted in Vancouver for some offense or other uh, for counterfeiting liquor licensing things. <laughs> and uh, so they moved to Prince Rupert to escape the law, I think. He later went to jail again. Uh, anyway, so he couldn't look after me, so he kind of found homes for me. You know, they'd, he would dress me up and take me around to the homes of strangers you lived who obviously in, took money for, uh, to yeah, take you, me in. You lived with five different families between the ages of 7 and 14. Did you oh, that's about right. Did you understand at the time that that's kind of not how a normal childhood works? I think most of us at that age take the life that's handed to us. I wasn't making any comparisons. I dealt with the, uh, with the world I had. I was aware that if the checks from my father stopped coming in, and my father did very well, by the way, in the bootlegging business, we might as well we might have been as rich as the Bronfmans, except <laughs> he drank the profits. Uh, anyway, if the money stopped coming in, I was out the door. That was always clear to me. So I early realized that uh, the most important person in the world it was me in terms of who could look after me, that I had to look after myself and protect myself. And I also realized that I needed allies. Some people call them friends. I have, I'm good at friendship, and uh, I regard my friends as allies. Well, this leads nicely to the next question, which is, did you have a big mouth as a kid, Craig? Uh, I, I guess I did. I was told that I talked too much in school, always told that. I was called the babbling brook at one point, I remember. Uh, and uh, I remember one home where my father took me. Uh, they said, he sure talks a lot, doesn't he? And my father said, we're out of here. They're jerks. <laughs> uh, did that do you think help you overcome whatever problems you may have had in your private life, the fact that you're kind of quick with the tongue? Uh, no, it, I think overall it gets you into more trouble than it gets you, than it gets you out of. Uh, but anyway, I survived it. I think uh, my, I was lucky. My mother got her act together, uh, moved in with a guy, and then I moved in with her when I was 13 or 14 years old. My mother was a loving woman. She just had her troubles, psychological problems. I realize now more than I did about mental health issues. Um, and uh, so uh, she, I, that, that's what saved me, I think, was moving in with my mother, who was a funny, strong, intelligent woman uh, once she sort of got herself together. And how well, ultimately, then, did you know your father? He's a bit of a mystery to me. He came and went in my life. We never lived together. Um, and so I really didn't know him. I didn't know him very well. I, I regret that I didn't know him better. When he died, he left a well-organized will and money. Uh, so I, it's always a mystery in my life. I know nothing about his background. I knew that he, uh, he grew up in Copper Cliff, Ontario, where my grandfather apparently had a hardware store. But that's hmm. all I know. Hmm. Let's get you on the road to journalism here. At what point does the light go on and you determine, this is what I'm going to do with my life? Uh, well, it was either in Prince Rupert, you worked at the pulp mill. It was most people worked at the pulp mill. And I guess I would have ended up there too, but there was also a tiny radio station handed to the Canadian government by the U.S. Army when the war ended. During the war, there were about 14,000 American troops stationed in Prince Rupert. So the Americans, always interested in the welfare of their troops, built them a radio station. <laughs> Could you imagine? Uh, and after the war ended, they had none to do with it, so they handed it to the CBC. It was the smallest station in the empire. If we lost a light bulb, we were out of business. It was 250 <laughs> watts. Uh, and so I applied for a job there as a summer relief announcer. And uh, they hired me because they, they were desperate. Uh, I knew they were desperate. And uh, so I started at the world's smallest radio station, 250-watt station uh, in Prince Rupert, B.C. It all began at a 250-watt radio station uh, yeah. in Prince Rupert. How many people could say that? Okay, but then you're going to have to explain to us how Bing Crosby shows up at the radio <laughs> station looking for uh, you, of all people. Uh, my mother was down on the docks 
looking for tariffs, you know, she drove a cab, and a big yacht pulled up in the harbor, Prince Rupert being the salmon fishing capital of the world, still is, uh, and Bing Crosby and his great old pal, Phil Harris, came popping up to the docks in a little boat, and they said, look, we've got a problem, we've lost the radio and the yacht, I have to call Hollywood. Now remember that year, he was the biggest star in the world, mm -hmm. worth millions, but hated reporters, never talked to them, very private guy. So she knew the owner of the, of the telephone company, took them there, and then when, they, when he finished and said, wait for us, and when they finished, Bing Crosby said, well, what can I do for you? And she said, well, my son's at the radio station, could you give him an interview? And Crosby thought this was hilarious, so he and Phil Harris head for the radio station, walk in the door, There's, the reporters are all sitting around griping about the CBC, which everybody at the Corp always does for a career, except when they're attacked <laughs> from the outside, and then they close ranks. And, uh, and, uh, they, and Crosby said, is Craig here? They all look mouth, open mouth, gaping with awe. Well, no, he isn't, Mr. Crosby. Well, tell him his old pal Craig popped in to say hello, and then he disappeared. <laughs> Nobody even said, wait a minute. You were a hero for I a day. I was off uh, with my day off. Your day off. But you basically did everything at the radio station, well, like, yeah. like everybody did in those days. Everything. You did well, I cleaned the place. I, yeah. And we, you know, once a week we had to clean everything, and I'll never forget cleaning out a toilet bowl one day. There I was scrubbing, and the senior announcer, Merlin, Uncle Merlin, uh, we all had little titles there, uh, said to me, you know why you're doing this, Oliver? And I said, no, sir, why am I doing it? I've never forgotten this advice, by the way. He said, Be so that our powerful and important jobs will not make us too proud. <laughs> I thought, oh, okay. That's, That's not bad advice, reason. actually. Yeah. yeah. Okay, let me move you into, uh, you then move to uh, CBC in Regina, and you get to know Tommy Douglas pretty well. I guess he's, yes. the, he's the Premier of Saskatchewan at the yeah. time. and I was covering uh, the legislature there. You call him the Tommy. best speaker you've ever heard. Still? Uh, yeah, funny, uh, always making points. Uh, and this was in the days when, you know, uh, our film and the cameras ran out every two or three minutes, mm -hmm. and uh, Tommy would say, well, just signal me. So Tommy would be going on in the speech, our film would run out, I would signal to him that I'd run out of film, then he would go into one of his stories, wonderful stories he would tell, until I signaled to him that we were rolling again, and he would just gracefully sneak back into his message. Tommy was a great guy. I admired him immensely and enjoyed his company, and I, he was, always had that Scottish burr, and I loved the way he used to say my name, Craig. <laughs> Craig, it's good to see you. Now, you are... Um you were too circumspect to go into much detail on this, so I'm going to give you an opportunity to go into more here if you want to. But All you right. described the Trudeau governments of the 1970s and Ottawa of the 1970s as being filled with hedonism, sex, and drugs. <laughs> now, I was a little younger than you at the time, so I don't remember it that way, but care to elaborate? Uh, well, it was, it, that's, that was the style in a lot of places. Not everybody was using drugs. Pierre never used drugs. You know, he, he regarded his body as a temple. Mm. He would never do anything to violate the temple of his body. But many people in his government did. I went to parties where everyone was smoking marijuana. I remember one night everybody put, uh, uh, put tea cozies in their heads. Imagine how ridiculous we all looked. I didn't mm. smoke it only because I found out I was allergic to smoke. And I still mm. am. And it made me, gave me awful flu. So I, I, would, I, had, I was observing the rest of them. <laughs> there was a little bit of cocaine, not very much. But there was an awful lot of, uh, of fooling around, a heck of a lot. <laughs> this was, you know, after the pill, uh, life was easy. And uh, they, that was his government at the time. But it was a serious government, too. You know, I mean, uh, brilliant people worked there. I, I, I don't want to blacken the name of everyone in the, in the Trudeau government of well, that era. Well, 1979 comes along, and Joe Clark unexpectedly upsets Pierre Trudeau in that election. And I want you to tell us what happened at a news conference in Prince Rupert where your mom and Joe Clark's wife almost came to blows. Yeah, Joe's wife had just had a baby and I think she was going through a little of the postpartum stuff. Maybe, I don't know, I never figured it out. Uh, this was, I was on the Joe Clark tour as a reporter. At the airport, my mother came to see me off. We, Joe was in Prince Rupert. Um, I got up to ask a question. Joe had had the worst trip I've ever been on. We, we were arriving in places and there'd be nobody there. He had no organization. No advance man, nothing. It was a disastrous trip. And I was kind of leading the pack, uh, pointing out every night on the national news how bad this trip was and how hopeless Clark was looking as a leader. So I got up to ask a question, and Maureen shouted at me, stop crapping on my husband, there you go again. And my mother shouted back, 
you, sh you shut up, you leave my little boy alone or I'll come and kick you. So Joe had to calm his wife down, I had to calm my mother down, who by then had had a drink or two. And I got back to Ottawa and ran into Pierre at a, an event and he said to me, you never worried me, Oliver, but I don't ever want to run into your mother. <laughs> now, the, the conventional wisdom on that election was that Clark lost it in the House on a vote of confidence because he couldn't count. Yeah. But then you had a, a conversation with Don Mazankowski who gave you another theory on this. What, yeah, what I had lunch with Don, one of the great guys in the history of Canadian politics, by the way, a wonderful gentleman. Mulroney's deputy prime minister, leader, for those yes. who forget. I had lunch with him that day, and he said, we're going to take, take a defeat tonight because all the polls are showing we can probably win. Uh, we've looked at the numbers. We think we can win it. Uh, and so uh, they did. They, they knew they were going to go down. And in fact, they even had a chance when Ellen McEachan stood up. They could have changed the business and given themselves some time to work things out. Uh, but they didn't. They went for the vote. So it wasn't a question of Joe not being able to count. Their judgment was that they could win the election. And I think most of us felt they were right. And, and Clark was running a good government. And even then, it was all about reducing the deficit. And the, the Trudeau people, you know, they didn't care about the deficit. They used to say to me, nobody cares about the deficit. Canadians don't care about the deficit. We're just going to let it roll. Hmm. Let me talk to you now about the Rideau Canal and Arctic Canoe Club. Yeah. What is that? Uh, that's a little group that my dear friend Tim Kotcheff and I started together. We started making Arctic trips, uh, Tim and I, alone. And uh, that can be dangerous. Um, one canoe, you're in that cold, fast water, you hit a rock, you dump, you're out there all alone. Uh, so we decided we'd better get other people into this uh, trips. So over a period of 30, 35 years, we collected a group of friends um, in journalism and in politics who just joined us for 30 years of high Arctic canoe trips. And this was high Arctic. Most of these trips were north of the Arctic Circle. Uh, we did seven rivers that had never been paddled before in Canadian history, except perhaps by Inuit in, in their vehicles. And uh, um, we all became close friends. We made the most northerly trip in world history, I think, to the end of Ellesmere Island, about seven or 800 miles from the North Pole. And uh, we just, uh, so that's what, we just called it the right Rideau Canal because that's where I lived. Uh, canoe, an, an Arctic canoe you're, group. You're going to have to explain something to me here because the stories you tell have many of you almost drowning, heavy winds, rain, <laughs> screaming at friends, Donald <laughs> McDonald, the former finance minister, you know, blasting you for almost getting one of his kids killed. Yeah. Um, how is that fun exactly? Uh, <laughs> well, it wasn't always, but most <laughs> of the time it was. Uh, and in that case, I made a judgment with Don and his kids were on the, on the copper mine. I made a judgment to cross a wide stretch of uh, lake and it was a wrong judgment. The wind came up. I couldn't have predicted that. And we had to really go for it with big white caps. And Don was pretty shaken uh, because his kids weren't great paddlers. But anyway, we made it. We were all fine. And uh, Don that night enjoyed a lot of glasses of scotch and so did I. <laughs> it came down. Yeah. How did Pierre Trudeau end up in that club? Uh, this was after he was defeated in, uh, in 79. I had an old friend named Eric Morris who was also a friend of Pierre's. And I ran into him at a party of Eric Morris's birthday. Eric Morris being the founder, really, of recreational canoeing in Canada in the 20s and 30s. And uh, so I said to him, we're going on a trip this summer. Um, some of them people coming, you know. Uh, why don't you join us? It was obvious to me that he was suffering. Uh, he didn't take that defeat well. And he said, you know what, I'll come. So we went to the Hanbury Thelon River, and he was a good companion. He kind of told a funny joke at one point in the middle of the trip. There was a phone call come in for somebody, and who did he say it was? Uh, no, it was an airplane. Airplane we, we coming got, in, that's uh, right. It came in very close over us. And uh, Trudeau said, uh, the Clark government has fallen, and they've come to get me uh, <laughs> to form a new government. Well, not very <laughs> far after that, it was true. That's exactly what happened. Yeah. You talk about in this, uh, this in the book, so I'm not going on untrod territory here, but... Um, Go ahead. There, I, I can take untrod. Yes, you can. <laughs> there were some suggestions and whispers around that you were too close to the Liberals. Here you are yeah. canoeing with Pierre Trudeau. Yeah. You've got Donald McDonald there yeah. as well and others. Yeah. Uh, do you think it was, was. true? Oh, you, I was. You were? Yeah, I was. Uh, I compromised myself terribly. Um, uh, it just kind of happened slowly. I met Trudeau because I own a Campanola who I grew up with in Prince Rupert. was in his cabinet. So it was she in those days. She needed uh, an escort that was a safe escort. Nobody would think we were romantically tied. And so uh, I started going on all kinds of events with Iona. And uh, so I got to know Trudeau that way. That's how I knew him, to be able to invite him on the trip in the first place. 
And then through him, I got to know members of the cabinet, and they felt that I was a friend of Pierre's, and they would ask me, you know, can you talk to the boss about this or that? I can't make any headway on this issue or that. I would be with cabinet ministers at dinner. I'd be hearing cabinet secrets, really, and then not be able to use them. And I realized that this had compromised me terribly. It had. Um, I'm not particularly a liberal ideologically. Um, and uh, so my boss and I agreed that I needed delousing for a while. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I left for, uh, for Washington they sent for you to Washington. 10 years. Where you ended up at a private party for Ronald Reagan. Now, yeah. how did that happen? Uh, well, I'm at my office one day, and I get this blue-bordered envelope uh, from the White House inviting me for a private dinner with Ron and Nancy. And, and so, he's president at the time. He, well, yeah, he was president, yeah, at the White House. I, of course, thought it was a joke by people in the office, but I phoned the social secretary. I could hear the ice in her voice because you would know that a Canadian correspondent in Washington is right up there with, uh, I don't know, the smallest African radio station <laughs> that you could imagine. Uh, we're not important players. And I could hear the ice in her voice. She said, I'll call you back, Mr. Oliver. Half an hour later, she called back, warm, friendly. Yes, Ron and Nancy are looking forward to the visit. So I went over to the White House that night, had a great dinner. I have a picture of it, Ron and Nancy and I together. Uh, Ron at one point went out on the Truman balcony and I went out and he, with two of us were alone. We chatted about Canada and what it was like. And, uh, Great evening, great evening. I mean, just one of the most memorable nights of my life. The Marine Band playing in the background, champagne in my hand. Uh, a week later, an old friend of mine at CBS called me, and he said, boy, has Craig Oliver ever PO'd about this? I said, who? He said, Craig Oliver, he's the head of uh, public broadcasting, radio and television, and he's a friend of Nancy's, and you were supposed to be him. They got the wrong guy. And you profited from that. That yeah, was all I did. right. I did. Now, at one of these private Washington parties, apparently, Bill Casey, the then director of the CIA, approaches you and tells yeah. you Pierre Trudeau's about to quit. Yeah. How did he know that? Well, I, you've got to wonder. Eh? I mean, I, I think the, at that time especially, when relations were very delicate with Trudeau, they were very bad, and they needed, they wanted to make an energy deal with Canada very badly uh, for reasons we all understand. So my guess is that they had them pretty carefully bugged. Uh, so I phoned Pat Gossage and I said, who was then the Prime Minister's press guy, I said, is anything happening with Pierre? He said, no, no, as far as I know, he's not going anywhere. I said, oh, okay, well, I guess, I guess the person I heard was just talking off the top of his head. A week later, Pierre took his walk in the snow. <laughs> and so, retired, and that yeah, was it. Yeah. I mean, that, would you have considered your, I remember asking Bill Davis this once after Pierre Trudeau had died. I said, were you, yeah. and, were you and Pierre Trudeau friends? Yes, we were. And, uh, and in fact, uh, I actually said that to him. I said, you know, I'm wondering if we know each other well enough that I could consider you my friend. And he said, yes, you could. Huh. And he made sure I was invited to the funeral. Um, and we had a lot of good talks. Um, he, he was, I was very fond of Pierre. Uh, he was a real good guy, but he was a very private guy. In that sense, you know, there were similarities between him and Stephen Harper. They're both intensely private, very intelligent, uh, essentially with a shy edge to them. The difference is that Trudeau was theatrical. He, had, he, really, he really loved theater, and he, a lot of what he did was theatrical for effect. But he was really an introvert, Pierre, and the same way that Harper is an introvert. Mm -hmm. I remember but, when Davis, when I asked Mr. Davis the question, he said, I'm not sure anybody ever really was friends with Pierre Trudeau. No, if you said to me, was I close to Pierre Trudeau, I would have said no. Uh, okay. Nobody was ever close to him. Okay. He guarded himself very carefully. You couldn't get him into any kind of personal intimacy in terms of discussion ever. Hmm. Uh, but also, he was a person without any vindicativeness. Um, he was, you know, he, he, he just... He regarded the people as political opponents, but you'd never hear him talk about them as enemies. And I remember one trip when somebody really unloaded viciously on one of his political opponents, and he said, save the personal stuff, stick with the issues. Don't, hmm. don't waste your time on people's personal lives. What would you say was his greatest virtue? Uh, his greatest virtue was he knew who he was. The same way, by the way, that Stephen Harper knows who he is. He knew exactly who he was, he knew he wanted to do, it took him a while to get there. He, t he, kn he knew what he wanted to do. Uh, he had great charm when he decided he wanted to have charm. And he was a person who believed in compassion uh, and justice. You, since we're talking about Harper as well here, you reveal in the book that Prime Minister Harper actually called you at the beginning of his tenure to ask your advice about stuff. Did you feel comfortable offering him advice? Uh, well, 
I guess. I mean, he said, how, what, what, he said, what word of advice have you got for me? Just one line. I mean, you know, look, we all spend a lot of time with politicians. You become friends. But you don't become cozy friends, but you become friends. You have lunch, they're, you're talking about what you're doing, and, in, and you can end up giving them advice. I mean, they say, what do you think of this? What do you think of that? Anyway, so I said to him, you know, don't overexpose yourself. This is something Trudeau always knew never to do. Hmm. People get tired of seeing it. Don't overexpose yourself. Don't feel you have to interview everybody you ask every day. And he said, okay. So next time you ask for an interview, I'm going to say no. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, yeah, I've met the Prime Minister a number of times, and personally, when people ask me, I always say, one-on-one, -on -one, he's very funny, very charming, yeah. and yet he has this image of being a, an awkward, secretive, mean-spirited guy, which he is from time to time as well. well How do you reconcile those I, two things? I don't things? think he's mean-spirited. Awkward, yes. Charming, mm -hmm. no. He's not really charming. He's, he's, he once said to me, I'm a, he said, I'm a wasp. It's hard for me to, <laughs> to, to open up and really be warm to people. But he's always respectful, um, and he engages directly, the same way Trudeau did. He right at you, uh, which uh, quality I, I really appreciate. Any reporter does, I mm. think. He's had asthma since he was a kid. I wonder what effect that's had well, on that's his personality. Well, that's one of my views is that as a kid, while the other kids were all playing vigorous sports, rolling around, batting each other, uh, he had to watch. And I think that gave him a load of resentment that he's never quite gotten rid of. And now what is he doing? He's working on a book about hockey. Yes. He couldn't be there playing hockey and bashing around with the other kids, but he could set the rules. Do you think he's an angry, resentful type of guy? Uh, I don't think he's angry, but I think he does have a load of resentment that he's probably had to deal with. And hopefully he's dealt with it now that he's had all that power. I saw him the other day. He seemed to be in pretty good shape. Hmm. Let me ask you, can I do a couple of news of the day questions with you here? Yeah. You think the Liberals and the NDP should merge? Absolutely. They should? Absolutely. No question they should merge. If they don't, uh, the Conservatives will be in power forever. I mean, we've all said, this is not a, a, a blinding insight, that uh, that's what, how Kretchen stayed in power. Harper's got, what, at the very best, 38, 39% of the vote on a good day. Mm -hmm. He needs the opposition parties divided. And uh, if Justin Trudeau takes uh, the Liberal Party and they can't defeat Mulcair, if they can't really clean up against him, my guess is Justin would be a guy who would, who would do it because he, he dislikes, I don't want to use the word hates, he intensely dislikes Harper and what Harper represents, not Harper personally. Hmm. Uh, and I think he would do anything to see that change, including merging these two parties, if Mulcair would agree. Do you Mulcair know, at the moment has to say, well, no, I would never do it, but what else can he say? Right. Do you know the son as well as you knew Justin's father? Uh, well, I guess I can't say I do. I know him very well. Hmm. Um, and, uh, but I, you know, I, I've done a lot of social events with him. Can he but, do the job? Yes, he can. He could he's be matured, the leader. He's matured a lot. Um, I think the question is, uh, so much of leadership is the judgment to know when you're given bad advice. That's really what it's all about. So I'm just, up to now, I think he's shown pretty good judgment in the decisions he's made. Look at the risk he took in that boxing match. Mm -hmm. uh, but I just, that's the only question in my mind. Has his ma judgment matured? He's now 40 uh, to the point where he can do it. I, I think it probably has. He's really grown up a lot in the last few years, and we've all seen that. Okay. Craig, in our last few minutes here, I want to just get a little more personal with you again, mm -hmm. okay. closing some loops that, that you raised in your book. How did your mother die? My mother died of lung cancer after a lifetime of smoking. And I remember she used to say to me, this is all BS about cancer and smoking. Look at me. I'm in great shape and I'm smoking a pack a day. The last thing I did was took a cigarette box out of beside her after she died in the hospital of lung cancer, which spread to her brain. What did Jean Chrétien say to you after your mother died? Uh, <laughs> Jean Chrétien phoned me. I was at the funeral uh, and he said, uh, Craig, I know your mother died. I know your mother. Uh, he said, I'm sure you're very sad. But think about me. What do you think I think? He said, you've, you've only lost a mother. I lost a supporter. My mother loved Kretchen. My mother loved him. She, my mother saw a vulnerability in Kretchen, which most people don't see, maybe because of his childhood palsy, uh, if I've got that word right. Palsy, um, yeah, it's Bell's palsy. Uh, palsy, yeah, Bell's mm -hmm. palsy. Um, uh, she really liked him. And at one point, there was a campaign which I didn't know at the time. She decided to work at his headquarters. 
Every time the phone rang, at, this was in uh, Vancouver, the phone rang, she'd say, Mr. Kretchen's headquarters. They'd say, no, 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 this is the headquarters of the candidate. <laughs> well, isn't Mr. Kretchen the boss? Well, yes, he is, but, well, then I'm answering Mr. So they finally had to find somebody <laughs> else to answer the phone. Those who know you know you don't see well. Those uh, that who, is putting it mildly, my friend. Those who don't know you won't know anything about this. So oh, why, thank don't, you. why don't you tell us, how, how much can you see in this studio right uh, now? Well, uh, I describe my vision as a way of helping people as very bad uh, Monet uh, painting. Huh. So if you like French Impressionism, bad French Impressionism, uh, you'll know what my vision is like. So I can only see you as a, as a colored shape. Uh, if somebody else had been sitting there, I wouldn't have known the difference. I can't recognize people. I can't, uh, I can't read. Um, but, you know, I'm saved, as many people like myself are, uh, by the digital era, which does wonderful things for us. I have software which reads the computer to me. I have my Kindle in my briefcase, and so I read books that way. So I'm, ba I'm essentially blind. Um, I am blind. If you um, can't read... When, for example, you used to host Question Period, or when you're doing a voiceover uh -huh. track for a script, how do you read your script to lay it down? Uh, well, first, when I'm, when I'm talking on camera, I memorize what I'm going to say. I, the, the crews have built a great big light, and I look at the light so I know where to look, and I memorize what I'm... This is why my on camera is usually short. In terms of voiceovers, we're getting very technical here, but <laughs> I write it, of course, um, and... Uh, the producer reads what I've written back to me in the earphone in the, in the, in the bo voice booth, and then I read it back as we go along, and then they cut out the gaps. Hmm. You have two children? Yes. From two different marriages? Yes. What business have your two children gone into? Uh, well, they're both in our business. Isn't you know that. Isn't that right. something? <laughs> yeah, yeah, isn't that a surprise? Now that, well, you know what? Uh, I mean, you didn't go into bootlegging, so apparently your, Im <laughs> your influence on your kids was somewhat more or, significant. Or taxi driving. <laughs> My, yeah. yeah. So your influence on your kids was somewhat better than your parents' influence I guess. on you. I have a very good relationship with both of them. It's, they're great kids. My daughter just graduated from the Columbia School of Journalism in New York. I'm <laughs> leaving this studio to get on a plane, go to New York, and spend a week with her. Isn't that fabulous? Yeah. And how about your son? Uh, my son is uh, sort of the senior editorial person at APTN, Aboriginal People's Television <laughs> Network. Um, my son was our correspondent in Africa for years, and he says... Um, uh, you know, there, there are similarities. There's a third world dimension, as you know, to uh, the life of many aboriginals, and mm -hmm. he's there helping train a lot of people. Hmm. You are 75 now, is that right? 73, if you don't mind. 73. I'm a young guy. Sorry, my <laughs> math stinks. <laughs> Only 73. <laughs> Only okay. 73. Having said that, you're, you've been at this longer than most people get a chance to be at this. Why yeah. do you still do it? 55 years. Uh, I still enjoy it. And I, I really like the young people I work with. I just enjoy their company so much. And you know what? At the end of a, of a day of doing stuff like this, I feel so good about it. I, I just think, wasn't that great today? I enjoy the, my chores in the morning when I get up and head to the office. Um, uh, I like politicians. Uh, I like politics. So how can you have a better life? I've known 11 prime ministers, some of them very well. Um, and uh, also, they pay me for this. <laughs> which helps. Craig, you do it awfully bloody well. Thank you, and, and so I, do you, by I, the way. Thank you, and I wish you many, many more years thank of doing it. Thank you very much. This has been a lot of fun. Craig Oliver, Ottawa Bureau Chief, CTV News, Oliver's Twist. Not Bureau Chief. Oh, Bob Fife will be mad about oh, that. Yeah, listen, he chief can call, political correct. I was he, Bureau he, Chief. He can call himself the Bureau Chief. We all know who runs the show there. <laughs> Oliver's <laughs> Twist, the life and times of an unapologetic news sound. It's so great to have you here in the studio. Thank you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.